just ask our kids for a moment. So our kids are going to be with us today, and we're going to have story time with Pastor Seth. And so I encourage you, we have some coloring sheets in the back for you to take notes and to listen and draw a picture of what you hear today. But uh, I need some help from the kids. Um, who are some of the heroes today that kids live up to? So you can just shout them out. Who are some of the heroes? Oh, there's a... Yeah, that's the pastor's... Okay, yeah, that's, that's a good answer, Okay. It's like the Sunday school answer. You know, like there, there was this teacher that asked, okay, you know, what, what, uh, what, what is small, furry, and, and has a, a, a brown, long f- uh, tail? And the, he's like, you know, it sounds like a squirrel, but I know it's Jesus, right? And uh, <laughs> um, uh, I love it. Okay, now who are some other heroes, though? What, what, what do kids today look up? I know church kids look up to God and Jesus. That's, uh, you know, that, that's great. Um, but, but what do kids today in your classes, who do they look up to? Groot, Okay. Who else? The teacher. Okay. I love that. Okay. Anyone else? Who do kids today look up as heroes? Spider-Man. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So we got Spider-Man, Superman. Yeah. Okay. So (laughs) that's great. Um, And it's interesting when you look at who people look up to for their heroes, who the kids uh, look up to today, um, who the adults look up to. You know, there's an organization, a research organization, uh, YouGov, that that tracks who the world most admires. And so they do these these polls uh, throughout the throughout the world. And uh, they publish the, each year the list of the world's most admired people. And it's interesting to see how it changes from year to year. Uh, at the end of last year, the five most admired men were Barack Obama, Bill Gates, President Xi of China, the soccer star Cristiano Ronaldo, and Jackie Chan. Okay. Five most admired women, Michelle Obama, um, Angela, Angelina Jolie, uh, Queen Elizabeth II, Oprah Winfrey, Scarlett uh, Johansson. Johansson, I, I probably get massacred her name. That's all right. You could, you could tell I'm really big on my movie trivia there. Um, you know, some are politicians, some are athletes, uh, movie stars. Most all of them are really rich. Uh, the, the list changes this year and every year. And I wouldn't be surprised at the end of this year, uh, Vladimir Zelensky would probably make the list of the most admired people in the world. If you don't know who he is, the, the former comedian, now the Ukrainian president, he's been called a Winston Churchill in a T-shirt. Uh, you know, when, when uh, President Biden uh, offered him evacuation, when Russia invaded his country, he famously countered, I don't need a ride, I need ammunition. All right? And the world went, yes. All right? uh, if you were to make your list of people that you most admire, who would make the cut? All right? Would it be based on looks, wealth, athleticism, political influence, TikTok views? Uh, and, and I would hope not, because we need heroes that, that model uh, not only what the world you know, considers successful. In fact, we don't need those kind of heroes. We need heroes who model what God considers successful. All right, let, let me uh, uh, help me with this. Would all of you raise your, raise, raise your right hand into a fist, and, and, and everybody make a fist with your right hand, and bring it up to your cheek. I, oh, there we go. Cam, okay, I'm looking around. Uh, I, I said your cheek, and, and, and you brought it up to your fist. You know, and the reason is because we tend to follow examples over instruction. All right? And so we need good examples in our lives. And this is one of my favorite things when, when studying the, the Bible heroes, the, the heroes that the, the Scripture gives us. And the interesting thing about the heroes in the Bible is that the heroes aren't sugar-coated. All right? They're not sugar-coated. It doesn't do what other religions do for their heroes. It doesn't try to rewrite history to portray someone in a better light. The Bible gives us the heroes, and, including their struggles and their failures. And through their examples, we can see that God delights, God enjoys taking imperfect, regular, ordinary nobodies all right, that, that the world would not have considered a hero, and God empowers them, and he uses them in miraculous ways to accomplish his purposes. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn me to 1 Samuel 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16. After several weeks of foreshadowing, we're finally going to be introduced to David today. And I know uh, weeks ago I said, we're going to do this study on King David, and then we didn't touch him for five weeks, all right? Uh, but we're going to get to David today, and it's important why we did it the way we did it. But David is the only one in Scripture who's called a man after God's own heart. 
There's more written about David than any other character in the Old Testament. Abraham, he gets 14 chapters, Joseph 13, Jacob 11, Moses gets 40, but there's 66 chapters in the Old Testament given to the life of David. Even in the New Testament, there's 57 references made to David. Uh, he had triumphs, failures. He wrestled with how to be a good parent, um, how, how to love. He wrestled with temptation, loyalty, uh, uh, friendship, just to name some things that, that David dealt with. And uh, we have been studying King Saul in the weeks beforehand, and he also had struggles. But the difference between King Saul and David is that David grows, and he, he learns, and he repents when he has these struggles. He, he makes changes. Uh, Saul does not. He flounders and he fails. And so the last three weeks, we saw King Saul make three big mistakes. In chapter 13, um, he used religion to try to get what he wanted and disobeyed the prophet Samuel. Chapter 14, he tried to take credit for Jonathan, his son's heroism, and he made some foolish oaths that almost get Jonathan killed. And then last week in chapter 15, we saw uh, him directly disobey the voice of the word of God. And, and God says, that's enough. That's enough. I'm, I'm removing my favor, uh, the, the anointing of, of Saul, and it's going to go to another who is better than he. And this grieves the prophet Samuel. It, it breaks his heart. Samuel was vested into Saul. He loved Saul. Um, he, he saw him almost like a father sees a son. And so when, when, when Saul makes these mistakes and, and basically forfeits the kingdom, uh, Samuel grieves, and they, would, they go in one direction. Samuel goes one direction, Saul goes in the other. They would never meet again until the day of Saul's death. Tragic, tragic story. Saul, on the, on the outside, he looks like a hero. He's taller than any man in Israel. He's handsome. He's, he's you know, the Zelensky on the outside, but he's a Stalin on the inside. And when Samuel learns that God has rejected him, he, he grieves and he panics. Uh, he, he gets so depressed, you know, realizing his stallion is really a donkey. And, uh, and he faces this emotional time. And that's where chapter 16 opens up. But what Samuel needs to learn is that when people panic, God doesn't. God provides. When people panic, God doesn't panic. God provides. And in those moments of panic and uncertainty, we need to remember that God has a plan. Uh, in fact, go, to, go back to, um, uh, you don't have to look it up, I got on the screen, Isaiah 46, uh, we're told this, remember this and stand firm, recall it to mind, you transgressors. Um, so this is God speaking to us, sinners, transgressors means sinners, and he says, remember the, what happened in the past, remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, there is no one like me declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done. He tells us things that are going to happen. He knows all things across all times. And he says, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. And so we panic, but God knows exactly what he's going to do. So 1 Samuel 16, now you can go there. So, uh, and I can be reading on the ESV if you'd like to follow along in your own copy. We have several in the back. You're welcome to, to grab one and take it with you. But in 1 Samuel chapter 16, the Lord says to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? We have a reminder of why, um, uh, why the grieving happens. And God is saying, it's not time to dwell in the past and in the grief, and I'm going to give you this hope and this promise. Sometimes God has to bring us through pain and turmoil and desolation in order to show us that he has a plan and then a purpose. And sometimes you can, re you can remember those points in your life. Things look bleak, and there's no hope, and, and, and there's no purpose for my life. And then all of a sudden, you round this bend, and you're like, oh, there is hope. There is purpose. Uh, we used to uh, live out in California for a time, and, and we were blessed to live just about a, uh, an hour's drive from the gates of Yosemite National Park. And so you would drive into this park, and... Um, um, out in California, they have all these wildfires, but one of the ways they prevent wildfires is by starting fires of their own. You know, it, it sounds counterintuitive, but they do that to clear out the brush and, and things like that. And so they start these fires on purpose. They control them uh, to, to prevent bigger forest fires. And so they had done one of these burns, and one day they were going up to Yosemite, and we're driving through a burnt-out forest. 
it is desolate. There's ashes all around. You know, there's, there's no leaves on the trees, obviously. And it's like, well, this is, you know, pretty miserable sight. We're driving through the, the remains of a burnt out forest. This is going nowhere. And then we went through this tunnel down into Yosemite Valley, and it, the tunnel opens up, and before you there are waterfalls and cliffs and just the most awe-inspiring, one of the most awe-inspiring sights I'd ever seen. And, and you would have never guessed that that, that, that awe-inspiring scene was there from the, the burnt-out forest just a, a, a mile or so back. And I think life is like that. Sometimes we're in this middle of this burnt-out uh, road. Like, where are you going, God? There's nothing ahead of me. And he has to bring us to that point in the tunnel where he says, there's something there that I want you to see. Hold on. Keep driving. Wait. It's coming. And so God lets Samuel drive down that road of grief and despair, probably longer than Samuel would have wanted. But now in, in chapter 16, verse 1, he tells him that he has a purpose and a plan. Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And so the wording is important. Uh, among Jesse's sons is a king, not of people's choosing, not of the people's choosing, but of God's choosing. And so you think Samuel, he'd be wanting to make this trip. I can't wait to meet this guy. But Samuel says in verse two, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. Right? He's in panic mode. His eyes aren't fixed on God's promise. Uh, his eyes are fixed on Saul. He's looking at Saul, and we can understand that. You know, I mean, Saul, he's narcissistic. He's thinking of himself. He's disobedient. He is very insecure. He's a little bit crazy, a few fries short of a happy meal. And, and you, know, he, you know, he's not that stable of a king. We're going we're gonna to see just how unstable he gets. But, but Samuel's correct in assuming that there's a real danger here. And so God actually addresses his fears, but he doesn't directly address what Samuel says there. The Lord said in verse 2, Take a heifer with you and say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. And invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. And you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. Now this is interesting, because some of you look at that, and we have the whole story, like, well, God is telling Samuel to be deceptive. No, he's not. He's telling him uh, what to do, but he's also giving him a glimpse that God is going to use this sacrifice and use this situation to show Samuel who the next king is going to be. Follow me. And so we don't always get the end result. God doesn't tell us, this is what I'm going to do through this situation, through this uh, commanded obedience. God just says, obey me, take this next step, and I'll do what I do. But Samuel, he gets this insight. He's a prophet of God. But for us, all we need to do, we don't need to know the inner workings. All we need to do is take the next step and obey. And we don't have to know the, the end result, the mind of God. Just obey and follow him and trust that God knows what he's doing. Take a heifer, go to Jesse, sacrifice, look around, and I'll tell you what to do. So Samuel did, verse 4, what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, do you come peaceably? Hey, that, that's pretty funny. You know, why would, they, why would they do this? I mean, this is old man Samuel. Well, remember, what's the last public thing that Samuel did? Right? He hacks apart King Agag with a sword before the Lord. Right? And so, so here comes Samuel, right? and, and I'm sure that uh, they heard about this down in Bethlehem. Uh, they may also know that Samuel and Saul, they're at odds right now. And so they panic when they see Samuel coming to them, and they have this look of fear on their faces. Do you come peaceably? Um, I've had people give me that look um, uh, when we lived out in California. I, I uh, volunteered at a hospital uh, as a chaplain. I would go around to these different rooms and pray with people and, and support them. And, and, um, but the thing was, um, most of the people in the city that, I was, that hospital was in spoke Spanish. You know, between 80 to 90% of the population spoke Spanish. And, and so I didn't speak much Spanish. I tried, but, you know, it doesn't always come out right. And so... The, the head chaplain said, hey, if you learn a few Spanish words, you go in there, it's going to make them relax, and they're going to you know, be able to open up and, and trust a little bit more. And it's like, oh, this is great. You know, and, uh, and so I learned a few Spanish words, and I came in and said you know, in Spanish, hi, I'm, I'm, I'm Pastor. I'm, I'm Pastor Seth. And, and all of a sudden, you know, they drew their blankets up, and they had that look of terror and panic on their, on their faces. I'm like, what did I just say? All right, so I go to the chaplain who spoke fluent Spanish, and, and she said, what did you say? And so I said, this is what I said, and, and this is the reaction I got. And she said, oh, 
You don't understand, Pastor Seth. When, when you say that you're a pastor right there, they equate that with a priest, and they think you're there to give them their last rites, you know, that, that, that they're going to die. You know, and, and so in Catholicism, you know, when, if somebody gets their last rites, they're, they're on death's edge right there. And so, like, okay, you're, you're causing some panic. That's the kind of thing that I was doing. Uh, the story actually gets better, though, because, like, okay, I can't call myself a pastor. I'll call myself a chaplain. And so I went, you know, hola, you know, me amo Seth, and uh, estoy you en champion. And then they started cracking up and laughing at me. And <laughs> a couple of you that know Spanish are, are cracking up too. Because I thought I was saying chaplain, which is champion. Uh, champion means mushroom. And so, you know, I, <laughs> but I guess I was helping them. Laughter is good medicine, all that. But uh, anyway, um, but for, for the people of Bethlehem, panic. All right, Samuel's coming. Do you come peaceably? And so he says in verse 5, Peaceably I have come to sacrifice the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. He doesn't give them all the reasons. He doesn't say, I'm here to anoint a king. I've come in peace. I've come to sacrifice. Here you go. And specifically, I want Jesse and his sons to come. And so everybody's there, so Samuel thought. Everybody's standing around, a bit of awkwardness. He's looking at them. They're looking at him. He's waiting for God to tell him what to do. And at this point in verse 6, we get some insight into what Samuel thinks. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. All right? And so right there, that insight into Samuel's thinking tells us what Samuel considered heroic. All right? He's tall, physically impressive. We know that he's a warrior, we learn in the next chapter, because he's fighting alongside of Saul as they face Goliath. It's coming. Uh, we're going to get to Goliath next week. Uh, but at this point, Samuel, he's focused on the warrior. Eliab, surely this is God's anointed. But God speaks to Samuel, verse 7. The Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. All right, and now the heart, you know, it doesn't mean the, the, the muscle in our, in our chest. The, the heart in biblical language is the essence of who a person is. It's, it's the part that, that people can't see, the part that we usually want to hide from others. Of people really could see my, my, my inner thoughts and my emotions and my motivations and who I am, uh, I, I, I want to hide that. And so we, we dress up the exterior because that's what people see. That's what people see. And literally, it says, man sees according to the eyes, but the Lord sees according to the heart. A God doesn't look at us the way that we look at each other. God doesn't look at us and say, hey, great body, you know, uh, great resume. You look great today. You know, uh, and, and for some of us, this is really good news. And for some of us, it's bad news because it, it, it's good news if you say, okay, you know, I, you know, on the inside, you know, if, if people would, would not like me, I'm, I have this insecurity, I'm inadequacy because I feel the eyes and the judgmental of other people and they look at my exterior and they don't like what they see. But God sees the inside. That's the good news that, that God doesn't look at the external like people do. God sees that. But for others, that's maybe bad news because if we're honest with ourselves, uh, we know that we don't have the kind of heart that God would want for us. Uh, in fact, some of us, we spend so much more time on the exterior, on the outside, than we ever do on the inside. But that, that kind of begs the question, if we spend more time looking at the mirror on the exterior than we do on our heart, Whose opinion do we really care about? Do we care more about people's opinion of us, or do we care more about God's opinion of us? Um, you know, I learned the lesson, you know, and just same as anybody else. Um, I learned the lesson, though, in churches, because uh, sadly, a lot of churches will pick their elders, their leaders, uh, deacons, whoever the leadership is in that church, not, uh, based upon how they look, how rich, how successful they are, how they speak. And some of those churches are no longer standing. All right? And if they are standing today, sometimes it's because they had to go through a literal death and resurrection as a church before God can use them again. And so, you know, I had to learn that lesson the hard way. And so before coming to Calvary, I wanted to know what kind of leadership does Calvary have? All right? what, what's, who are they on the, on the inside? And we have 
great looking elders too. I mean, I'm not going to say that, but, uh, um, but they're, they're beautiful on the inside. And I wanted to know that. What kind of people are they? Where, where's their heart? And you guys did the same thing for me. I know that you didn't pick me based on my appearance. Um, that's, that's obvious. Um, but God says, you know, to choose leaders according to their character. And so we have lists of things to look like to indicate the character. Uh, faithful to their spouse, self-controlled, cautious, uh, not uh, people that get drunk, don't pick fights, uh, don't love money, manage their households well, gentle, hospitable. All these things together give us an indication of the heart. Right? And, and, and that's not just a direction for churches. Um, we can apply that, you know, singles. What kind of person uh, are you going to date? What kind of person are you going to get engaged? Do you choose someone that just looks good on the outside? Someone that dresses well, someone that speaks well, someone from the right family, someone from the right ethnicity, from the right social class, or do you choose somebody that's chasing after God? If you judge people based upon the, how they look, that's, that's spiritual blindness. Right? Um, that's why racial tension is as high as it's ever been in my lifetime in our country because people look and judge and make decisions based upon the color of someone's skin instead of their character and their skills and their abilities and, and all these things that make them who they are. But fortunately, God is not blind like we are. All right? The Lord sees according to the heart. And Eliab, I mean, he's for all his height, outward appearance, uh, 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 military expertise, you know, he's not the one that God wanted to be king. And in fact, in chapter 17, we're going to learn that he's actually pretty condescending towards David. Um, he actually has some character flaws. So this is the situation. In verse 8, Jesse called Abinadab, and this can be repeated over again, and it made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Now Jesse's getting to know, okay, something's going on here. Then Jesse made Shema pass by. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. Pretty confusing. Probably to, to Jesse, probably to Samuel. God said, I chose one of Jesse's sons. Here's Jesse's sons. And God says, nope, 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 seven times. But there's a son number eight. The youngest child, the, uh, a child who is not respected in the family, not respected among his older brothers, uh, a child that's not even given the privilege to come to the sacrifice. He is the one to tend the sheep. So Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him for we will not sit down till he comes here. All right, we're going to do a, a, a standing, uh, you know, a stand up, you know, not a sit down strike, but a stand up strike until he comes here. And so there's a guy running, right? And, and Jesse, he never would have considered that Samuel would want to see David. Uh, that word in the Hebrew for youngest is the word hakatan, uh, which is uh, like calling somebody the runt, right? He's the runt. He's no warrior, right? He's small, he's thin, the kind of guy that's got to run around in the shower to get wet. You know, he's not the kind of guy that you would want, Samuel. Uh, in fact, he's out doing the lowest job in Israel, watching the animals, right? And so if you had any means, right, you would have servants or slaves watching the animals, right? It's not uh, a, a high um, fluent job here. And so, I mean, and we know that. I mean, it's so surprising that God would announce the birth of Jesus to shepherds in the field. It's so surprising that Mary and Joseph would lay Jesus in a, in a feeding trough. Um, uh, animals are dirty, uh, they're, they're unclean, and the people that, that tended them, they're not usually the high people in society. And so David, meanwhile, he's out in the field watching the sheep, unaware of what's happening in the village. He's, he's, he's doing his job, and all of a sudden, this guy comes running across the field. Hey, David, they want to see you back in the village. And so they brought him in, verse 12, and he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. Um, and so we get a description of, of, his, of his appearance here. Um, he, nice eyes and handsome, uh, the word for, 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 for good in Hebrew is tov, uh, but he's not the warrior type. Some have kind of argue what, what ruddy means there. It can mean uh, kind of a reddish complexion, um, uh, either in the hair or freckles, but it could also mean that he was dirty, unkempt, disheveled, tan, and smelled like a sheep pen. All right, and so uh, the point is, you know, he, he you, know, you know, there's not, nothing 
wrong, but he doesn't look like a king that the people would have chosen. He's a runt with baby face and nice eyes, right? But what's most important is what God sees. The Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. He's going to be someone different than King Saul. King Saul saw people as a means to serve him. David is going to be the kind of leader that sees himself as a servant to the people. And, and that idea of heroism through serving others is modeled all throughout Scripture. It's so counterintuitive. Right? This does not make sense today. Any hero uh, that, 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 that you would think of today, you know, when you, I look down that list and, of, of people, and we don't see that too often, that servant leadership. This is countercultural, but we see it in the Bible. Joseph, Moses, Gideon, uh, Samuel, David, uh, ultimately Jesus as a servant leader. And, and in fact, Philippians 2.4, this is the attitude that all of us are to have. So Paul says, he said, let each of you look not only to his own interests, all right, don't just look at the self, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And so we're to have that countercultural attitude um, in our marriages. Husbands, love your wives as Christ, what? Love the church. How did Christ love the church? He died for her, right? Um, have this attitude in, in our studies, in your work, um, in your jobs, in your communities. See yourself as a servant of others. And here comes David, back at the line, serving his family, Samuel takes the horn of oil, verse 13, and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And so they get to see this. And at this point, the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward, and Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. And this, this verse right here, first time in the Bible we hear the name David. Right? And Samuel departs, and we're wondering, okay, how is the shepherd boy going to get to be king? Well, the spirit of God is going to have something to do with that. Because the Spirit of God empowers us to live for God. Um, we said this uh, in the last couple weeks. In the Old Testament times, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, would come upon a person and empower them for a task, and the Holy Spirit could leave that person. That's what happened to Samson. That's what happened um, uh, to, to, to others. We saw that with the judges. It happened with Saul, in fact. The Spirit of God came upon him, empowered him for a purpose, but the Spirit of God is, is departing. Uh, or as we're going to see. But in the New Testament times, I want to make this very clear, the Holy Spirit doesn't come on a person and leave a person in the New Testament times. Okay, so after, after Pentecost, when the church was born, there's a difference. There's a difference. Uh, the, the believer, when you repent of your sin and turn to Jesus, uh, believing that his death on the cross and resurrection is payment for my sins, and, and you, you, uh, that you have that heart change, I'm not living for myself, God, take control of me, be my Lord and Savior, call on the name of the Lord, and, and you're saved. Um, now God gives us his spirit, and we're adopted into his family, we are sealed, uh, we are baptized into the, the family of God, and, and so this is a a new reality for us, and the Holy Spirit is the seal upon our lives. It's the guarantee of our inheritance, and that is different from the Old Testament. Uh, uh, we don't lose the Holy Spirit. We're not told to be uh, in. We're not commanded to be indwelt um, uh, or sealed with the Spirit. That automatically happens when you become a Christian. And so, but in the Old Testament times, different. God put His Spirit on David, but there's something different about what we're told about David. Um, it says there in, in verse 13, the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day what? Forward. Okay, so this is interesting. That's really interesting because um, uh, you know, you know, th th this didn't normally happen. The Spirit of God was, was temporary, but with David, something's different. The Spirit of God's with him from that day forward. Not so with Saul. Verse 14, the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. And I wonder, you know, is this what David had in mind? Remember when, when David sins with Bathsheba, uh, he, and he writes chapter 51, you know, it's his repentance and his, uh, uh, his turmoil over his sin, uh, he, you know, and, and he pours it out. What does he pray there in chapter 51? He says, take not thy Holy Spirit. I mean, in, in other words, he's saying, hey, you know, what I did, my sin was, was uh, you know, God, you deserve to reject me. As you're anointed, you, you, des uh, you know, I deserve to have your Holy Spirit take from me. And he pleads with God, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Because this is what happened with Saul. The Holy Spirit goes. And it's interesting. 
that we have this harmful spirit from the Lord. Now, God is not evil. God does not tempt people or cause people to be tempted, but God does allow evil to do its work. Uh, remember Job, right? Uh, Satan was permitted to uh, torment Job, but through it all, was God ever not in control? No, God was always in control. And we need to remember that because we can experience the effects of evil in our lives. We can feel the effects of pain and hardship. Um, and and uh, for the Christian who has the Spirit of God, we have the capability to deal with and confront and, and um, uh, have victory over evil in our lives and temptation in our lives. But for the non-Christian that does not have the Spirit of God, you're just opening yourselves up to all sorts of terrifying things. Um, you know, with, with, with man, it's impossible for us to save ourselves, but with God, all things are possible. We can have victory over evil. But people notice what's happening to Saul. Saul's servants say to him, verse 15, Behold now, a harmful spirit from God is tormenting you. So there's this tormenting, this harmful spirit. We don't get all the, uh, you know, the, the chemical imbalance, the diagnosis, all that. We say there's a theological reason for why Saul is suffering. And God can use all those biological, physiological, chemical imbalances, all those things, but there's a theological reason behind it. And so you can make those diagnoses. Uh, sometimes God gives us a real thorn in our flesh for his purposes. Right? For, for the non-Christian without the Spirit of God, it is absolutely terrifying. Uh, for, the, for, the, for a child of God that has uh, the Spirit of God, um, we... Uh, know that God is using whatever thorn is in our flesh for his good purpose. Uh, this is what happened to Paul. Remember, Paul, he had this thorn in our flesh, we, in his flesh. We don't know what it was, but he prayed. Three times he prays, God, take away this thorn in my flesh. Take away whatever it is uh, that, that it was tor that was hardships in, in Paul's life. And God responded to Paul in 2 Corinthians 12. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I'm content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. That's good. When we are filled with God's spirits, we can cope with any physical, emotional weakness. Uh, and, and we are physical emotional, and spiritual. And when one suffers, the others can suffer as well. But we need to know and trust God that when we're, we're suffering physically, when we're suffering emotionally, um, uh, it, you know, the spiritual is, is what it gives us the, the sufficiency that we need to deal with and recognize that God works through weakness. God works through pain. God works with calamities. Um, I, I had a friend, he passed away a couple years ago. Um, he dove into a pool when he was in his 20s and broke his neck and was a quadriplegic for the rest of his life. You know, could, could barely move one arm, uh, couldn't move his legs, was in a wheelchair in his 20s. Newly married, his wife had to become his nurse and, and uh, uh, care for him the rest of his life. But he had a, he, he had a mind that wanted to, to, to serve the Lord and, and he developed this ministry, this Christmas outreach and, and, and used Christmas lights and, and drew people in, into the church and, and he directed a team of hundreds of volunteers from his wheelchair and uh, uh, the first year that, we, that he uh, ran this outreach, we had 40,000 people that heard the gospel. Second year, 50,000 people. And, and that went on for years. Hundreds of thousands of people were reached through the, the ministry of this quadriplegic. We would say, how can God use that? But God uses it and says, I delight in working through your weakness because it shows my strength. That's good. That's good. Uh, without God's spirit, though, Saul, his condition, it's devastating. But God's going to still use it, not so much for, 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 uh, for you know, Saul's uh, uh, salvation, but in order to move David into the throne room. Listen to this. Uh, so the servants say, let now, our Lord, they got this great idea. Command your servants who are before you to seek out a man, verse 16, who is skillful in playing the lyre. And when the harmful spirit from God is upon you, he will play it and you will be well. And in, in, in the ancient Near East, they thought uh, 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 that music was a, a cure or a balm for, for mental illness. It, and it still has that effect. The music kind of affects our emotions. Um, and so be careful what you listen to. Uh, so verse 17, so Saul said to his servants, provide for me a man who can play well and bring him to me. One of the young men answered, behold, 
I've seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. So already we see what happens when God's spirit comes upon David. All right, we don't know how much time passes between this, but in that short amount of time, because David's still going to be a young man when he faces Goliath, but David is no longer just a nobody that nobody notices. He's got musical skill, um, you know, not the sort of quality or skill that we would think is, is, is fit for a king, but God is going to use that to get David in the throne room. He uses music to bring Saul and David together. Therefore, verse 19, Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, send me David, your son, listen to this, who is with the sheep. That's interesting. David was anointed king. He had this horn of oil poured over his head in front of his brothers, oil running down, anointed king of Israel. And, and where does it go? All right, it, it, this, did they build a little throne for him in the family room and, uh, you know, and Hey, you know, we're going we're gonna to go to king's school here and prepare you to be king. He goes back to the sheep. That's interesting. Uh, and, and Jesse took a donkey laden with bread and skin of wine and a young goat and sent them by David, his son, to Saul. All right. And so, uh, you know, David is, is in the God's seminary for how to be a king, and that included the sheep pen. It's going to include uh, being a musician in, in the king's court, uh, rocking a, a crazy king to sleep every night, um, uh, doing all the duties, the, being an armor bearer. As we say, David came to Saul, entered his service, and Saul loved him greatly and became his armor bearer. And so God takes what we would say that's pretty insignificant and uses it because uh, as, as Saul sent to Jesse saying, so Saul writes, writes to Jesse saying, let David remain in my service for he has found favor in my sight. And whenever a harmful spirit from God was upon Saul, David took the lyre and played it with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well and the harmful spirit departed from him. Which tells us a little something about David. Um, David doesn't go into the throne room and, and look at the throne and say, get out of my chair. Right? He doesn't... Uh, uh, he'd been anointed king, uh, but he doesn't refuse to watch the sheep. He doesn't refuse to play the music. He does what God has before him to do. He has this tender heart that is willing to serve, and he uses uh, music. and And I wonder if part of the Psalms that that's, that David wrote, and we have a book of the Bible. You turn to the center of your Bible, you're probably going to hit the Psalms. Uh, most of them are written by David, and maybe some of them were written while David was in service to King Saul. It's wonderful. Uh, they're, they're prayers. If you ever struggle with how to pray, um, uh, what to pray, they're, 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 they're prayers. Of, many of them are prayers of David covering the whole gamut of experience and emotions. And so we see how God is working behind the scenes to accomplish his purposes. Whether it's tending sheep or playing music, uh, David is content to be doing what God had put before him to do. So let me give us a three, three quick applications in closing. First of all, be a hero in the little things. Be a hero in the little things. David has a heart uh, after God, and he pursues God, and God put his Holy Spirit upon him. And, and, and so this, this man of high moral character, it plays out in every area of his life. And so to be a hero in the little things um, is hard for us because we say, well, uh, God, you want me to do the big things. You know, I, I want to do the big things in life, right? And, well, God, if you put your Holy Spirit on me like you did David, well, wait a second here. Okay, the same Holy Spirit that God put on David is the same Holy Spirit that God sealed with you with on the day of your salvation. If you repented of your sin and called on the name of the Lord for salvation, you have the same Spirit of God that rests in David. Right? And, and, and that might mean, all right, that the, the Spirit of God means that you are, do well in the sheep pen. It might mean that you do well doing music. Um, and, and we are part of this, this heritage of heroes because we have God's spirit on us. Uh, that's what Hebrews 11 and 12 says. We have this list of heroes in, in Hebrews 11, the, the hall of faith of Abraham, Enoch, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, uh, Moses, uh, J um, Joseph, the judges. All these heroes are listed. And then in chapter 12, uh, we have this, since we are so surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay, also lay aside every weight, every sin, that clings to us, and run with endurance the race set before us. So he includes, let us also do that. We're surrounded by this, this cloud of heroes, so let's follow uh, their example, lay off the sin, and run after Jesus. 
looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, seated at the right hand of the throne of God. In other words, it doesn't matter how fast you run. It doesn't matter how, um, uh, you know, where you start the race from. It doesn't matter if you start the race in your 60s or 70s or 80s or if you started the race when you were four or five. It doesn't matter where you started. All that matters is the direction you're running and whether you're willing to endure. Right? It doesn't matter if you're top seed or last speed or, or, or last seed. Uh, are you running after God in the right direction? You know, and, and that's good. Because there are people that say, well, you know, when, when people look at me, I'm, I'm, they reject me, right? Because they're looking at the outside. And oftentimes it's the people that, that society rejects and say, that's not heroic, that God delights most in using. Right? And so wherever you are, whoever you are, whatever God has given you to do, do it, deciding to serve him through it. 1 Corinthians 1.27, you could jot this down. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And so what that says is that, that if we say, I'm a hero and I rely on you know, my strength and my power and in my circumstances and I made this and I did that, God doesn't want to use that. Where's the glory for God in that? You get all the glory. But, but if we can say, uh, you know, God, despite my, my weakness and, my, and, and be humble before God and God, I, I have nothing to offer you that, that you need from me except my heart and you use what you do and, and you take my weakness and I have these uh, illnesses and these calamities and these traumas in my past. How can you use me? God says, I delight to use that because in your weakness, I can show myself to be strong. I can get the glory. God loves to do that. And I love that David's a teenager, that he's a young man when God chooses him. Uh, you know, spiritual maturity isn't related to how old you are. Right? I know people in their 70s and 80s that are spiritual infants. And I know teenagers that are, are walking strong after God that are so spiritually mature. And Joseph, Joseph was a young man. Daniel, a young man. Timothy, a young man when God chose them. David flourished, even as a young man, because he was controlled by the Spirit of God and ran after God with his whole heart. That's a good message. If you're a teenager, um, you know, this is what it looks like to be controlled by the Spirit of God. You're going to break the mold. You're going to break away from the pack. You're not going to live a life of obscurity. You're going to be set apart for greatness if you've run hard after God. David, he is humble. He's a servant. He doesn't know how God's going to use him or what God's going to do through him, but he's faithful to do it in the midst of whatever he's doing. Second application, real quick. God sees you when nobody's looking. God sees you when nobody's looking. And so, again, timing's not according to my plan. That My situation's not according to my plan, but it's God's plan. And so I need to be faithful in what I'm doing, that God sees me when nobody's looking. And so that means that, that that's character. All right, so when nobody's looking, I'm not going to be surfing the web. I'm not going to be sulking, complaining, uh, slacking off, surfing the web, uh, shopping online, browsing social media. I'm going to be faithful uh, and, and have good character even when nobody's looking. Because even the, the lowest job that you can think of today can be done in worship to God. Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, Work at it with all your heart as working for who? The Lord, not for men. That's good because some of you have pretty terrible bosses. All right? All right. All right. You, 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 I, I, Tamika, don't say amen. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, you know, what, what, whatever you do, you're, you're, you're not working for that terrible boss. You're working for God. And so you... you Look to Jesus and you do it. Whatever your hand finds to do, Ecclesiastes 9, 10, do it with all your might. And David, I mean, he's been anointed king. He knows he's destined for greater things, but he's faithful even in the little things. When, when evil seems like it's having its way, we can trust God. That's what the people of God do. We're called to be faithful. We don't try to be famous. We be faithful. Because God is working behind the scenes. And you, you know, for example, um, our sights are set on, on something that might be so insignificant in God's plan while God is doing all these little things. Um, 1809, 
everybody's eyes were fixed on Napoleon as he's marching through Austria, you know, taking over the world. Everybody's worried about Napoleon. But in 1809, you look at who was born that year. Um, you have William Gladstone, uh, Alfred Tennyson, Oliver Wendell, uh, Holmes, uh, um, Edgar Allan Poe, you know, uh, Charles Darwin, Robert Charles Winthrop, uh, and in Kentucky, uh, an illiterate laborer and his wife named their newborn Abraham Lincoln. All right? And, and so you know, God is you know, doing all these things, and all these these children are being born, and 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 nobody except you know maybe a, a nerdy historian could name one battle that Napoleon fought. Right? But we've all felt the effects of all those other people. We've all um, uh, know their names, and so you know, in, in this day and age. You know, a thousand years before Jesus was born, every eye is fixed on Saul. Nobody's eye was fixed upon David. But God's eye was on a nobody watching sheep in the family farm in the middle of nowhere. God was looking at him. So lastly, people see the outside, God sees your heart. People see your outside, God sees your heart. Uh, the ultimate example of a hero is Jesus Christ. You know, when we said, who's your hero? The, the kid had said, God, that's right. Uh, you know, because David, as heroic as he's going to be, he's a shadow of the king to come. We're told in Isaiah 11, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, a branch from his root shall bear fruit, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Okay, and the spirit of the Lord central here, a spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what? eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear but with righteousness he shall judge the poor decide with equity for the meek of the earth he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked there shall be justice done righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins that's good. Jesus is the ultimate king that sees not as people see, that doesn't hear as people hear, but judges with righteousness and equity and fairness. Jesus is the hero of this story. Jesus is the hero of this story. Lived most of his life in obscurity, regular blue-collar job, not born in a palace, laid in a manger, didn't have the power and privilege. His life and his ministry were headed for a cross. You know, and, and, he, and you might have an idea of who Jesus is. You might, you know, know that he has a, uh, lived a moral life and started this world religion. But the, Jesus is ultimately different because he died on a cross and didn't stay dead. And God uses his death and his resurrection to purchase us and save us from the consequences of sin, from our future and hell that we deserve. And the good news is, you know, not that we win, but that Jesus wins and we get to share in his victory. And some of you may have come, some of you might be listening online, and you've already made up your mind about Christians based upon what you've seen, based upon the externals. And, and sadly, what you might have seen might have been what we call in Christian circles a hypocrite. Somebody that looked like they were Christians, somebody that acted like they were Christian on the outside, but on the inside, their hearts couldn't be farther away from God. And I just want to say, if that's you, I'm sorry for all those hypocrites in your life that put those stumbling blocks there. But that's not the issue. You know, when, when someday, when you stand before God, you can't say to God, well, I didn't believe in you because there were just all these hypocrites here. All right? And God's like, I gave you a chance to say, well, there were so many hypocrites. No, that's not the issue. All right? Hypocrites, they need to have a heart change just like somebody that knows that they're lost have to have their hearts changed. And God can see the heart of a hypocrite just as God can see your heart. And the, the thing is, knowing that God knows your heart, do you know your heart? Do you know that you need to have your heart changed by God in order to have him radically revolutionize your life? Let's pray. Father God, we, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you uh, for all that you are. We we. Um, Thank you for this lesson about God, you working through what we consider insignificant. That you saw through the externals and saw the heart of a young shepherd boy named David and placed your spirit on him so that the world would never be the same. 
And God, you want to do the same thing to us, to place your Holy Spirit on us and use us for your glory. And I thank you for those that have already made that decision, for giving them your Holy Spirit. And I pray that they would let your Holy Spirit drive them and be controlled by your Spirit so they can serve you in everything they do, in everything they say. You would transform the relationships as you make us more and more like Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray for anybody listening that has been soured to Christians and to the church by what they have seen on the exterior. And I pray that they would be confronted not by what they see, but by the truth that they're that if they hear the good news and have given their life to Jesus Christ, that they can be saved. And so, Father, I, I pray for that person that wants that peace and joy and that purpose and wants your Holy Spirit to, to transform them into a hero to be used by you. That they would open their heart to you. The way that you can be saved is through admitting your sin, repenting of that sin, and turning to Jesus Christ. That's what repentance means, is a turning. So you can call out to him in prayer even now. I'd just like to lead a, a prayer for those listening online or here in person that would like to make that decision today. You could pray something like this from your heart. Lord, I, I know that I've sinned and I'm sorry. Forgive me. I turn my life to Jesus. I believe he died on the cross for my sin. I believe he rose again. I believe he's coming again. So right now I give you my life and ask you to be my king. I turn to Jesus as my Savior and Lord. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Give me the power to live for you. I don't have it on my own. Give me your power to love others as you love them. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you have prayed a prayer like that at any time in your life, uh, God's spirit comes upon you and adopts you into his family. And the, the word for that in the New Testament is a church. Uh, Calvary Bible Church is just one local um, uh, part of that church. And so wherever God has placed you, there are, are churches that, that preach the Bible around you. I encourage you to find one. Um, if you don't have one and you're in this area, we would love to connect with you and show you how can, you can be equipped to love others in your lives and, and reach them with the good news that there is a God that loves them and wants to uh, use them for his glory. So go be a hero for God this week. Uh, God bless you. Go be the church and we'll see you next week.